Hey, my name is Nathaniel Fawson. I'm an archaeologist. I have been for over 10 years. And this channel is dedicated to the archaeology of North America in the region that we call the Eastern Woodlands, especially prior to European colonization. Now, I've taken a very long break from this channel. Uh, that's mostly because I've been I've spent the la most of this last year working as a field director on some survey sites in Arkansas, and I really just didn't have the time for it and uh, wasn't really feeling inspired to do much uh, do much content creation. But now I'm off that. I'm back to excavation based work and I'm starting to get some kind of ideas of what to talk about again. So getting back into the, the groove of things, I want to go through a few papers that have been published in the last couple of years in the journal Southeastern Archaeology. Today, specifically, I want to talk about archaeological monuments and ceremonial sites. Um, these kinds of sites tend to get a lot of academic attention and public attention, but uh, our perceptions of them tend to be fairly skewed towards what they look like after the final phase of construction. What's left that actually gets excavated that always feels like the ultimate pinnacle form of any of these sites so we can consider for example poverty point at this site there's mound a which is the largest mound there and it's such a defining feature of that ceremonial site this ceremonial complex that it's hard to imagine poverty point being a thing without mound a but mound a was one of the last things constructed there so if we're thinking about this site in terms of its total use life, we have to erase Mound A until the very end. So we have to understand that these kinds of sites have life cycles and everything constructed is not necessarily meant to be permanent. This degree of impermanence with structures specifically is what Tom White and Alice Wright are trying to explore in this paper from 2023. The study is all about the remains of wooden posts. In most cases, a post that is put in place will rot where it sits and this leaves behind a cast of the original post, usually in like a darker, greasier soil, called a post mold. They're round, cylindrical soil stands, and we can identify these during excavation. In other cases, the posts have been deliberately pulled out, and the hole is filled back in, also deliberately. If this fill is different enough from the surrounding soil matrix, if they filled it back with something not the same is the, the soil that was dug out in the first place. For instance, uh, if the backfill is full of gravel or artifacts or something like that, we can also identify these, these locations as uh, post holes. Oftentimes we'll get constellations of these post holes and post molds that form circles or rectangles, and that shows us where structures were in the past. So the outlines of architecture. These kinds of features are the sorts of things that Artifact collectors regularly destroy digging up sites because they're not looking for them. They're looking for the objects, not the material correlates to architecture that's not there anymore. Tom and Alice start out by pointing out that while the permanent structures that people built into the landscape are obviously very labor intensive and important, uh, ceremonial sites also include important structures that are built and deconstructed regularly perhaps annually, as part of particular feasts or celebrations or festivals or whatever. They use maypoles as an analogy for this. Maypoles are put up on the May 1st of every year and then taken back down at the end of the month during certain celebrations in Europe. Tom and Alice see a similar cycle of construction and deconstruction at two Hopewellian sites in the Appalachian Summit region dating roughly between 1800 and 1400 years ago. These sites are the Garden Creek site and the Biltmore Mounds, which Tom worked excavations at Biltmore Mounds and Alice's dissertation work was on Garden Creek. And both of these are located in the Carolina High Country. At Garden Creek, it was found that Mound 2 was built on top of a building called Structure 1, which was made from 29 posts. Before the mound was built, the posts were removed and the holes were backfilled with a coarse white sand. This specific choice of backfill material is easy to relocate in the much darker surrounding soil and is especially easy to re-excavate. We're going to come back to that claim at the end of this video. The sand contained some conisty faced ceramic dating after 800 years ago, but the midden surrounding the structure included earlier pigeon phase material. 
It's entirely possible that the people at Garden Creek were in the habit of periodically deconstructing this building and then rebuilding it in the same post holes, perhaps for an annual ceremony. They deliberately made those post holes easy to find and re-excavate. Further to the east of Structure 1, Alice's team found two rectangular post structures. The important one here is Enclosure 1. This consists of a rectangular ditch which was backfilled with three different kinds of soil in discrete layers, with high concentrations of mica and quartz crystal. Then posts were dug into the fill of the ditch. The posts were removed and the post holes were filled with stone cobbles. If you're familiar with Hopewellian culture, you'll know that mica and quartz are regularly featured at significant ceremonial sites. These are significant ceremonial materials. So it's possible that the filling in of this ditch and the post structure was part of some kind of ceremonial activity. Or it happened at a time where ceremonial activity was happening and it just happened to take place at the same time in the same area. I'm usually pretty hesitant to ascribe anything to ceremonial activity, but I think based on the material correlates we've got, it at least makes sense to tentatively say this is related to ceremonial activity. The Biltmore Mound near Asheville, North Carolina also featured a ditch and post feature on the periphery of the mound. These post holes were filled with yellow sand, similar to structure one from Garden Creek. A central post 50 centimeters across was found at the center of the mound itself. This post appears to have rotted in place. It had not been removed at the final stage of monumental occupation. But underneath, there is a series of four thin soil lenses, which may be the result of the large post being removed and reset several times, similar to the maypole I talked about a second ago. Now, this is a Tom White paper, and if you've seen the one I did about frogs a couple of years ago, you'll know that Tom likes to use experiments to evaluate his interpretations before he just goes off and makes a major claim. Uh, and one of the major claims of this paper is that the posts were being pulled and backfilled with deliberately discrete soil, like deliberately different color or different textured soil, uh, so that they'd be easier to find and re-excavate and then build whatever the thing was back on top of it again. Think like rebuilding of a big circus tent or whatever on the same spot over and over again. So Tom had his students dig out 12 post holes and he did this in the middle of winter when the ground was frozen to replicate the most difficult time of year that you could do this. Um, and he had them do this with a digging stick, a, a sharpened stick made of black walnut wood that was cut and then the end of it was tapered to be kind of chisel shaped. Tom had his students dig out these 12 post holes uh, by, quote, stabbing the digging stick into the ground and twisting to pry dirt loose. After three or four stabs, loose dirt was removed by hand. Excavation times varied between 13 and 17 minutes, depending on the numbers and sizes of rocks encountered. So then Tom had the students backfill the holes. Um, four with the original dirt that came out, four with cobbles from a stream nearby, and four with white sand. These refilled holes were then relocated and re-excavated a year later, also when the ground was frozen over. And if you look at this chart, it looks like Tom repeated the fill and re-excavation experiment three times so that each post hole was backfilled and re-excavated with each kind of material. And you can see that the re-excavation times are drastically lower for sand and rock fill compared to the original soil that was removed in the first place. He also noted that it was much easier to relocate the posts that were backfilled with rocks or backfilled with sand rather than the original soil fill. So this bolsters the idea that the deconstruction of certain architectural features was done with the intention of rebuilding at a later date. But at some point, sites were abandoned or ceremonial practices changed. So in the case of Garden Creek, uh, people stopped building Structure 1 over and over again because they decided to build an earthwork mound on top of it. It continued to be a ceremonial landscape that was being used for fairly similar functions as before, but that one was being modified in a new way compared to what had happened before the Hopewellian mound construction happened. Probably as a result of these people's you know, neighbors on the north side of the, the Appalachian Mountains, coming into more regular contact with them. All right, that's all I've really got to talk about for this one. Um, 
If you have any questions or comments, you can leave those down below. And as always, thank you for watching.